This video was brought to you by my loyal patrons. Pledge today and you can participate in choosing what video comes to the channel next. Link in the description. Duck loved coasting down the hill, running easily with the wind whistling past. He hummed a little tune. That sounds like a guard's whistle, he thought. But we haven't a guard. His driver looked back. Hurry, duck, hurry, he shouted urgently. The trucks were away. Hurrah, 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 they laughed. We've broken away, we've broken away. Chase him, bump him, throw him off the rails, they yelled, bumping and swaying with ever-increasing speed. Now what, asked the fireman. As fast as we can, said the driver grimly. Then they'll catch us gradually. They raced through Edward's station, whistling furiously. But the trucks caught up to them with a shuddering jar. Oof! Breaking carefully, the driver was gaining control. Another clear mile and we'll do it. They swept around a bend. Oh glory, look at that! A passenger train was just pulling out onto their line from the station ahead. The driver leapt with reverser, hard over, full steam. Whistle! It's up to you now, Doc. Duck put every ounce of weight and steam against the trucks. The station came nearer and nearer. It's too late! He felt a sudden swerve. They slid shuddering and groaning into a siding, where a barber had set up shop. This... this is Duck. The Great Western Engine. Let's, uh... let's start this again. Montague is a pannier tank engine from the Great Western Railway, where he worked at Paddington in London as a station pilot. Due to his apparent waddle as he went about, the other engines nicknamed him Duck. Montague preferred it, so Duck he became. Some years later, Duck went to work on the island of Sodor. He was a station pilot for a while, until graduating to running his own branch line along the coast with his friend Oliver. Duck is very proud of his great western heritage. A true traditionalist, Duck is sometimes rather stubborn and skeptical of others. But when push comes to shove, he is a very hard and reliable worker, and will go out of his way to stick up for the little guy. Duck will be a very interesting character to talk about for me. A long time ago, in about 2016 or so, I once made a video talking about my issues with Duck's overusage in the current show, a token of fan service and nothing more. I'm more than happy to say that I think that video is very, very outdated now. And as we'll see as we get into this, my opinions on the character have changed rather drastically. I have been enlightened. I see the bigger picture now. There is quite a lot more to Duck than meets the eye, and he represents something pretty damn great in this franchise. And what is that? Well, let's take a deeper look. Every character in this series has a funny reason for coming to be, and Duck is no exception. Back in 1949, well before Duck was a character in the books, Wilbert Audrey had a model train layout he would take to exhibitions. He purchased a spare engine to have on hand just in case, and this was a Gady Models 5700 pannier tank. The model, unfortunately, had a defect, a malformed wheel that made the engine waddle as it rolled along. Audrey's children christened the engine as Duck, and the name stuck, well after Audrey had swapped the wheels out on it. The name never left him though, and sure enough, a good seven years later, a pannier tank, nicknamed Duck, debuted in the 11th book, Percy the Small Engine. Here is his story. Montague is a 5700 class pannier tank engine, first designed by Charles Collett in 1929 for the Great Western Railway, built for shunting and manning small stopping trains. This was the most produced class of British tank engine ever with a grand total of 863 built. He spent his working life with the Great Western as a station pilot at Paddington Station in London. London's Paddington, 
Paddington, do you hear? I know, I work there. And later survived into British Railways ownership. The other engines at Paddington would say Montague waddled as he went along, so they all endearingly called him Duck. Montague quite liked that, and so the name stuck. Audrey states in the Island of Sodor book that Duck is number 5741, which would make Duck one of the first batch of the class built in 1929 at the North British Locomotive Works in Glasgow. That's right, he would have been built in Scotland, not Swindon. That would be a mind-blowing fact had Audrey also not written this. He states that 5741 is likely not the original number allotted to Duck when he was built. It's... It's never simple, is it? That actually adds up though, because the real 5741 never worked at Paddington as Duck did. The real 5741 worked in Wales for the majority of its life, and was withdrawn in 1957. I have no idea where Audrey got the number 5741 from. I thought it might have been the number that came default on the Gady Models pen here, but it apparently isn't. Regardless of the reason, by 1955, Duck was carrying the number 5741. Guess he swapped numbers with another pannier when he was last at the works or something. Definitely an opportunity for a fun fan story out there if anyone's willing to take that on. BR eventually saw little use for him, and sold him off cheap to Sir Topham Hatt on the island of Sodor, who was in need of a new pilot engine at his big station at Tidmouth. Duck arrived to the island in BR Black, but as Sir Topham was Swindon trained and had a soft spot for all things Great Western, he allowed Duck to be repainted back into his original livery and retain his Great Western number. In the first book Duck was featured in, he was interestingly illustrated incorrectly. Illustrator Clarence Dalby misdrew Duck as a similar Great Western pannier tank, a 6400 class. Not a huge difference, but this pannier had flat top tanks and a different cab. Wilbert, who predominantly wanted Duck to be a 5700 just as his model was, had the next illustrator, John Kenny, draw him as such. In this illustration from the story Domeless Engines, Kenny snuck in a little easter egg of Audrey with Dalby, pointing at Duck gesturing, this is what a 5700 looks like. Duck took over the pilot duties from Percy, who was being relocated to Thomas's branch line at the time. Percy showed Duck around, and the two quickly became friends. And for about the next 12 years or so, Duck was Tidmouth's station pilot. He got the work done without fuss, doing things, as he dubbed them, the Great Western Way. There are two ways of doing things, the Great Western Way or the wrong way. Duck is a character that is very proud of his heritage. The Great Western Railway was a railway that was very proud of its engines and its brand and Duck is the personification of that. He is the attitude of the Great Western Railway embodied into a character, and I love that he exists because of this. He is a marker of the era when the books really started to delve more into real-life territory. Now we have a prominent character that has ties with a very real-life railway, of which he wears blatantly on his sides with bonds to real engines in the real world. The city of Truro. He was the first to go 100 miles an hour. May I talk to you? He asked shyly. Of course, smiled the famous engine. I see you are one of us. I knew an engine called King James, remarked Duck, in the old days at Paddington. King James the first, he was. Duck exists in the books as a visual reminder to the readers that the railway series does indeed take place in the real world. Duck's ties to the Great Western is his greatest and most notable character trait, and also his most fatal, as this stick to traditionalism often makes him quite stubborn and unwilling to hear others out. I try to teach them our ways, said Duck modestly. All ship shape and swindon fashion, that's right. Say one bad thing about the old GWR, and prepare to get an earful. I remember on the Great Western, that tin pot railway. Tin pot indeed. Let me tell you. So, naturally, Duck does not get along with the big engines. On many occasions, we've seen him butt heads with the likes of Gordon, Henry, and James. I'm Great Western and don't we know it, they groaned. It's no wonder these characters never get along. Duck is a by-the-books traditionalist and the big engines just want everything done for them regardless of who it inconveniences. We've seen this conflict many times in the past. 
Thomas resorted to being cheeky and insulting the big engines. Edward resorted to teaching by example. And Percy, well, Percy liked to scare them. But Percy just went, Whoop! Henry jumped and ran away. What the fuck? Duck, however, is different. Duck actually fights with the big engines. He stands his ground and directly calls them out. We are not ordered about by other engines. Percy and I will be glad if you would inform these, uh, engines that we only take orders from you. Just pathetic, grunted Gordon. He should give up and be preserved before it's too late. Shut up, burst out Duck. You're all jealous. Duck called me a galloping sausage, spluttered Gordon. Rusty red scrap iron, hissed James. I'm old square wheels, fumed Henry. I only wish, sir, that I'd thought of those names myself. If the dome fits. They all warmed up to each other over time, of course, as real people do. But I got pretty fiery there at the beginning. We are tired of you. We don't like you. You tell tales about us to trucks. I don't. You do. I don't. You do. Shut up! Duck is also one to stand up for the little guys. In the very first story he was in, he befriended Percy and backed him up in standing up to the big engines. He later befriended Stepney when he visited, and the two of them had a little adventure together. This all aligns perfectly. Duck was a pilot at Paddington, one of the busiest stations in London. He knew how important the shunters were to ensuring all the trains ran on time. The real backbone of the railway, at least in his eyes. He probably also saw a plethora of snobby big engines too, and knew how to handle them. Duck's a city boy. He got toughened up working in the alleys. And when you throw him into a small, nowhere escapist countryside railway like on Sodor, it's really no wonder that he shook things up. But the character that Duck probably has the most noteworthy relationship with is Diesel. In the book aptly titled Duck and the Diesel Engine, Sir Topham Hatt decides to start trialing Diesels on Sodor and brings a Diesel shunter to the yard. He has Duck show him around, which of course leads to disaster. The Duck and Diesel story arc is such a significant one possibly one of the most important arcs of the whole railway series. One, because it introduces dieselization into the series, which forever changes everything. And two, because of its subtext. This is not a book that's as simple as Duck is the good guy and Diesel is the bad. No, it's more of a gray area. Diesel is pretty detestable, yes. We Diesels don't need to learn. We know everything. We are a revolutionary. And what he does to Duck later on in the book is pretty bad. But Duck ain't no saint either. He, unprovoked, pulled a prank on Diesel that ruined him making a first good impression on his first day. Duck stooped to a low, and Diesel was just as bad because he stooped lower to pay him out. Neither of these two are really all that sympathetic at this point in time. Diesel is a class 08 shunter, a class of literally hundreds, a rather common sight to be seen in any train yard across the UK. He is just one of many in a clone army. And Duck is really no different. A common pannier tank, of which also hundreds were built. Diesel is just the more modern version of Duck. These two are mirrors to each other. Diesels aren't necessarily worse than steam engines, and steam engines can be just as bad as diesels. They're really not that different. It's so subtle, and it's written so fairly. No one is above the other. They're both flawed, plain and simple. The difference is shown in how the book closes. This is Duck's book, and he of course is the one that comes through at the end of the story a close shave. Until this point, I'd argue Duck was a pretty unlikable character in the series. Yeah, he helped Percy out and stood for justice, sure, but his means of doing so disrupted everything. He argued pretty profusely with Gordon about London stations. He got a super ego after meeting City of Truro, and that led into playing a rather unfair prank on Diesel. Not exactly a glowing angel of a role model. A close shave changed that, and showed that when push comes to shove, when he's put in a dire situation where lives are at stake, Duck pulls through and is a hero. His heroic actions prevented a deadly collision with a passenger train. But you must know that this engine and his crew have prevented a serious accident. You and many others might have been badly hurt. This is his major redemption story. The story that made us really like him. I didn't know you were being a brave engine. That's all right, sir. I didn't know that either. 
You are very brave indeed, said the Fat Controller kindly. I'm proud of you. Duck is of course still a flawed character, but after a close shave, our outlook on him has changed completely. He is one of the mains, and a character that we know we can really root for. So, when a few days later, he came home shining with new paint, there was a really rousing welcome for Duck, the great western engine. And while Duck's overall story could have ended there, it doesn't. He served his purpose, he kicked off the diesel plot in a meaningful way, and he was a hero in the end. He so easily could have just become a minor secondary character that pops up every now and then, but he doesn't. Duck remains a prominent figure in the books after this. As the years go on, several diesels arrive to the railway, and almost every time, Duck is very unwelcoming to them. Our controller says steam engines spoil our image. Of course we do! We show what frauds you are! That makes sense. If any engine is going to have a prejudice against diesels, it's going to be Duck. When Boko arrives, Duck is cautious of him at first, but learns to accept him, and the two become good friends. While there's no attention really drawn to it, this little moment shows that Duck eventually got over that prejudice that Diesel first planted in him. Some nice subtle character growth there. A good 10 years go by, and eventually, Duck takes part in helping rebuild the branch line up the coast to Arlesboro. And because he had done such good work as a station pilot, Sir Topham Hatt decided to promote him. When the Arlesboro branch reopened for passenger traffic, he relocated Duck there to run the line himself with two of his own auto coaches called Alice and Mirabelle. Along also came Oliver and his two coaches, as well as Donald and Douglas. Cue the Little Western Saga. Now Duck is on a whole different part of the railway with all new faces he interacts with. The most prominent, of course, is Oliver, the other Great Western engine. As both are from the same railway, it's no shock that they get on like a house on fire. I like that the two are partners, always confiding in each other about what they're going to do next, like discussing the Scruffy situation, and keeping each other informed on what the latest is regarding Bulgy and his anti-railway tirades. Free the roads! Free the roads from railway tyranny! Then you also got Donald and Douglas, who Duck is very chummy with. In the story, Donald's Duck, Donald makes fun of Duck, so Duck and his crew play a joke on him, and then Donald in turn plays a joke on them. And it just keeps going until Duck calls a truce. You win, Donald, he said. It'll take a clever engine to get the better of you. It's all harmless fun. Donald and Douglas, and more specifically Donald, are like those friends that you can just joke around with and mock each other and no party takes it personally. He's also friends with the small Arlesdale engines, and he had a whole thing with Bulgy. I mean, Jesus, Duck had a thing with literally everyone. Why wasn't he the main character? I kind of get the feeling that Duck became a sort of go-to character for Audrey. One that he realized he had a lot to say about, and wiggle room to write fun stories with. He clearly ran out of steam with Thomas at a certain point, but Duck stayed consistent during his tenure. He was the series' breakout character. This is going to be a weird comparison, but I sort of align Duck in the series with a character like Steve Urkel from Family Matters. Can I do that? A character that was meant to only be a one-off in an episode from the first season, but was so beloved that they kept bringing him back season after season until he was a series lead. That's Duck. That's exactly Duck in the Railway series. A one-off that first appeared well after the series started, and he kept reappearing so much because there was just so much potential with him to unearth that he became one of our main focus characters as the series went on. From living in the busy, bustling city of London, to a background station pilot, to the kickoff of the series-long dieselization plot, to rebuilding the coastal branch line, to flat out running it himself, Duck really went far. It's no groundbreaking series-long Gordon character arc or anything, but it's pretty damn great. It's a shame Christopher Audrey never did much with Duck in his books because there was plenty more there for the taking. Duck's story in the model series is virtually the same as the books. The same Great Western origins, same overall character arc, same major characters he interacts with. 
Looks-wise, the only major difference is that Duck does not wear his Great Western 5741 number in the TV series. He is the 8th engine and wears a big ol' number 8 on his sides instead. Duck debuted in Season 2 and arrived to take over Percy's work in the yard. He didn't get along with the big engines, and later took issue with Diesel when he arrived. Later on in Season 3, he is promoted to work on his own branch line along the coast to Tidmouth Halt. He is later joined by Oliver, and the two run their little western line happily together. I would say that Duck's overall story arc from the books was pretty simplified for the TV series, due to the lack of some major stories he was featured in not being adapted for the screen, or being changed entirely. At the end of Season 3, Duck is basically in the same place he was at the end of Audrey's tenure, on his branch line, happy away with Oliver. You might think that's a point against the TV series, but it's actually not. What the TV series did extremely well was build off those major character dynamics that Duck had in the books. The most notable one in the series is definitely Percy. In the books, Duck shared a single story with Percy, and the two rarely interact again. In the TV series, they loved pairing these two up, especially in Season 3. It makes sense that these two are chummy with each other. Duck stood up for Percy, so of course Percy respects him and enjoys working with him. It's a bit of an older brother, younger sibling sort of thing, you know? It's not easy being green, right? The two worked together at the docks several times, one of which saw them deal with the return of Diesel. The episode All at Sea was a nice flip-flop of the roles, where Percy is the more sensible one of the two. Love this scene where he just gets mad and tells Duck off. Well, Duck, I'd rather have my wheels on solid ground. Our rails can take us to all the places we could ever wish to see. Scaredy Engines from Season 6 is a notable highlight as well, where Duck once again backed Percy and helped him pay Thomas out, which worked out better than they had hoped. He's after me! I don't think you'll be late, said Duck. Percy and Duck together took down the big engines, they got rid of Diesel, and they royally spooked Thomas. An unstoppable pair. I also really appreciate that the Diesel plot is actually followed up on in the TV series. In the books, it wasn't. Diesel just left forever and never returned, unless you count this book as canon. Diesel and Duck do meet again. In Season 3's Diesel Does It Again. And Duck, understandably, is a little on edge when he sees Diesel return. What are you doing here? gasped Duck. Granted, they don't really do anything meaningful with it, and it's Diesel's own stupidity that becomes his downfall. Duck going on strike until Diesel was sent away again was a nice touch, though. Showed how much he really resented the guy. With Percy, appropriately, standing by his side and striking with him. What's all this? We're on strike, sir, said Percy nervously. I can't talk about Duck in the model series without, of course, talking about... You all know the episode. Here it comes. All at Sea. This episode is the epitome of what the TV series did best. Showing new sides to these characters that were never present in the books. In this episode, we learn of Duck's fascination with the sea. He longs to know what's out there beyond the horizon line. He is so entranced by it that it actually distracts him from his work, which is so unlike him. The moral of this episode is pretty damn grand. Duck wants to know what's beyond the horizon line. He wishes he was something other than a steam engine, so he wouldn't be stuck to his rails and could actually go out and see it. I wish I could sail to faraway lands, sighed Duck. Percy, who is very content with his life, is bewildered by this. Engines can't go sailing, snorted Percy, because engines can't float. Duck still had his dreams. But only after Duck helps save a hurt man by getting him to the hospital quickly by rail, he quickly understands the purpose he, a steam engine, has in this world. In the end, he makes the realization that life's greatest rewards are not seeing what's out there, but at home, where he actually has a purpose and friends. Friends give you purpose. True happiness is finding where you belong, where you are useful, fulfilling the purpose you were built for. A really high concept moral, and one I think using sentient machines to vessel it is perfect for. Season 3 was a big year for Duck, 
It's the only season I would call Duck as a truly main character in. They really delved into him this year and changed his status quo. He was the real MVP. As the series went on, Duck would continue to make his rounds of appearances. He got another lead role in Season 4's Fish, where he completely dismisses Thomas's advice. Going fishing? I'd take care if I were you. Why, Huff Duck? Very in character for Duck to be skeptical of someone trying to tell him how to do things. And look where it gets him. Around Season 5 or so, Duck's appearances started to slow down a bit. They started getting to a point where he only popped up every now and then, and never again as the lead. Scaredy Engines in Season 6 was the closest we got to another Duck-centric episode, and it'd be the last time in this era that we see him, well, act like Duck. Season 7 rolled around, and Duck appeared only twice, and both times without dialogue. It was pretty clear by this point they were struggling to think of things to do with him. Twice they used him just as a thing to block the line, and for other characters to bump into. Duck had stopped at the crossing at the bottom of the hill. Squashed fruit flew everywhere. Little did we know, this would be how Duck went out. 2004 saw the release of Season 8. The first season produced fully under Thomas's new owners, Hit Entertainment. We all know what happened here. I've talked about it many times before, so there's really no point in going into detail. But here's a quick recap. Hit wanted to make over Thomas and market it solely to an even younger age demographic than before. They overhauled the show entirely, giving it a new theme song, I still don't understand why, changing the format and length of the episodes, dumbed down the writing style, and streamlined the cast to focus only on the eight main characters, now dubbed the Steam Team. Ugh. And some of these significant secondary ones. Sadly, Duck was not one of those significant secondary ones to stick around. Duck was completely absent in the new hit era of the show, not making a single appearance in all of seasons 8 to 11. Not even a background cameo. Nothing. It's like they just intentionally decided, eh, whatever, he doesn't exist anymore. He got a single, and I am not exaggerating, a single cameo shot in a music video. This shot right here is Duck's only appearance in all of seasons 8 through 11. Even in the film titled Calling All Engines, all the engines do not appear. Duck was just flat out MIA. But you know what? This is, in a weird, twisted way, kind of a good thing. This era was notorious for its formulaic, templated writing style, where the characters were reduced to the likes of children, making the same silly mistakes over and over again. Percy, for example, who was a plucky, feisty, cheeky, and quick-to-anger scamp in the seasons prior, was reduced to being the baby of the group, with an IQ of 7, so dumbed down to the point of not even knowing what a railway inspector is. What's a railway testicle? Wait, I've already made this joke. Most of the main characters were given this regressive treatment, and since Duck wasn't in these seasons, he was very fortunately spared of it. We thankfully never had to see Duck collect trucks of pink sugar and take them to the ice cream factory or whatever, or make some dumb mistakes that the true version of the character would never make. It is worth noting, though, that originally, Duck was considered to be a part of the new Focal 8 characters in this new era. I mean, it makes sense, he is the number 8 engine after all. However, he was dropped in favor of Emily, to have a prominent female in the show. I personally don't have an issue with making Emily a main character, but it's led many fans to think that Emily just flat out replaced him. I don't think that's really the case, to be honest. That would imply that Duck was one of the mains throughout the whole show up to this point. And as we just went through, he wasn't really in the show that much leading up to this. Seasons 2 and 3 were the only times Duck was majorly in the spotlight, and he kind of started to nod off after that. Either way, whatever the reason he wasn't in the show at this time, I'm just happy he wasn't. I don't think I could take seeing Duck pull the special, special ice cream train to the children's costume show or whatever the hell they do in these boring episodes. However, we didn't see the very last of Duck. Season 12 rolled in, the first to use CGI elements, 
and the final ever season to be filmed with model sets. As a kind of a final Hail Mary, they brought out all the old character props that have been forgotten over the years just to use them one last time. Characters that we hadn't seen for years made a return this year, including Donald and Douglas, Oliver, Toad, Stepney, Murdoch, and of course, Duck. There he is! Duck appeared in a bunch of episodes this season, never as a lead and always as a supporting character. But considering he wasn't in the past four seasons at all, this was kind of awesome. Like the show was trying to make up for lost time or something. Duck didn't do anything really noteworthy this year, and thankfully nothing stupid, but I'll just say, it was nice to see him again after all this time. You cannot imagine the fan reaction that fans had in 2008 when Emily rounded that corner and there he was, waiting at a signal. You know when Captain America wielded Mjolnir in Endgame? Remember how crazy the audience went? Yeah, this was basically that for us Dorky Thomas fans. Emily raced down the other side. Emily met Duck. Duck in the CGI series is interesting because, well, he wasn't in it, at first. When Hit took Thomas into the world of CGI, the first few seasons were very restrained. Only a handful of characters were present, and they piecemealed others over time. It was even more focused on those main eight than the previous model seasons were. Writing-wise, it's pretty safe to say that Thomas had hit a low point here, with stories that were even more formulaic and templated than before. I've done a whole video talking about that. When Mattel stepped in and outright bought the rights to Thomas in 2012, one of the first things they did was revamp the show. Out went the previous production team and in came an all-new one. Ian McHugh as producer, Andrew Brenner as head writer, and a bunch of new writers, most of which who had previous experience with the series. All of the steps were correctly taken to transform Thomas back into the great show it once was. There was very clearly an attempt on everyone's part to try and recapture that magic the original show had. And what was the first thing they did in the first season of this renaissance period? they brought Duck back. In season 17, Duck made his grand comeback to the series in the episode, Henry's Hero. Oh dear, looks like you two got some of the bad cold that arrived today. He even got a spotlight episode later in the same season, where the narrator gives the newer viewers a brief recap of who he is. Montague is a little green tank engine. But everyone calls him Duck because the other engines used to say he waddled. And even a photo of him working at Paddington in the old days. Something even the model series never did. Considering all the crap we had to sludge through for the past nine seasons or so, the little moments like this where they showed they actually did their research to stick to established canon really meant a lot. It was almost a way of the crew communicating directly with the fans, saying, We hear you, and we do care. It goes further than that. In the next season, Duck received another Spotlight episode called Duck and the Slip Coaches, and this time we actually got a flashback sequence. For the first time ever, they showed us footage of Duck working on the Great Western Railway. We learned he didn't always work at Paddington, Sometime afterwards, he worked on a line that was nicknamed the Sunshine Line, where he hauled a rake of slip coaches. In those days, I used to pull slip coaches. Coaches which could be uncoupled without even stopping. This little sequence is bonkers to me. The fact we got a little more backstory for Duck, the then at the time this relatively unknown secondary recurring character. Even the main characters like Emily didn't get these. It's these types of moments that make me realize just how good we had it back in 2015 or so. They really cared. 
They wanted to use these old characters in a meaningful way in the modern show, and they used this opportunity to fill in some of those gaps of time before Sodor. In retrospect though, I think this episode is kinda dumb to be honest, at least in how the events play out. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous how Sir Topham hears about slip coaches late that night, and somehow the very next morning, he just has them. How'd he find them? How'd they get delivered so quickly? And they just so happened to be the exact three that worked with Duck all those years ago. The slip coaches were overjoyed to see their old friend Duck. Hello, Hello Duck. Duck. Duck! Hello, Slippies! Imagine being Duck in this scenario. You go to sleep right after just talking about these coaches, and then you wake up and they're just magically there. Like, what the hell? Kind of a dumb episode, but I respect the fact we got a duck backstory in it, and that they changed the status quo for the character moving forward. Now Duck has a rake of slip coaches that are exclusive to him, and every time we see him on his line after this, he's pulling them. They were super consistent with this. This is the kind of stuff I really adore about the CGI series. I love it when the show makes a major change to a character or gives them a new permanent job or relocates them to a new area or something. When it's written well, of course. It shows growth. It's rewarding for investing all this time with the show. Even in its 18th season, the island of Sodor is still ever-changing and developing its railway. Duck consistently kept up his appearances in the show until it ended, getting at least one appearance in each season following. And even when the show entered the dreaded Big World Big Adventures era, Duck still managed to seep through the cracks and show up. He even, somehow, got a spotlight episode during this era. The episode, called School of Duck, was somehow pretty good. An engine trying to find use for an old dilapidated coach instead of letting it rot away in a scrapyard. It's a story that felt rather classic Thomas to me. In terms of characters that Duck predominantly interacted with in the CGI show, naturally they paired him up a lot with Oliver, as they work on the same line. That engine, I have no idea what she was talking about. Me neither. Dependable partners as ever, such as when they worked together to get everyone home before a storm hit the island in season 20. In season 18, they really loved pairing Duck up with James. Twice this season, Duck and James are the main characters of episodes. I totally get why they did this. They're characters that conflict with each other a bit. James is flamboyant and tends not to listen to reason. And Duck is all about logic and reason and doing things the proper way. Put these two in a room and, well, chaos ensues. In season 20, Duck interacted a lot with Skiff. I mean, that makes sense. Skiff works at a harbor on Duck's line. Of course they see each other often. In both of Skiff's episodes, Skiff has a desire to do something or see something that is a little bit beyond his reach. Seeing a mermaid. I've heard lots of tales about mermaids, just never actually seen one. And locking up the harbor before a storm hits. And both times, Duck sort of belittles him. A fish woman? You must have misheard him. We're not tiny little rail boats. Endearingly, of course. Sort of like a skeptical father figure, trying not to give his kid too much hope. If there is anything bad to say about Duck in the CGI series, it's that I don't think they did enough with him. And this is where my criticism in my original video from 2016 stems from. While I love that they gave him a backstory and kept him consistent with canon and his previous portrayals, I sort of felt like they stuck to the Great Western shtick a bit too much. Flashback to Season 3, the season that featured Duck the most, and I think he only says the words Great Western once the entire season. I'm Great Western and I quack, quack, quack. What? Whereas here, it's quite a bit more on the nose. Days like today remind me of summers back on the Great Western Railway. You never hear such a noise on the Great Western. There's only two ways to do things, Thomas. The Great Western way and the wrong way. There really are only two ways of doing things. The wrong way or... The Great Western way. There are two ways of doing things, Oliver. The Great Western Way, and the wrong way, I know. Like, I get it, 
that's his defining trait, and in a series that now has easily over a hundred different characters, compared to the hardy 20 or so we had in Season 3, you have to stick to that one thing that makes him stand out. And to be fair to them, they did start to phase it out around Season 20 or so. But there is so much more they could have done that I feel they missed the opportunity on. Diesel is such a prominent character in the CGI series, and we not once got a moment where he and Duck interacted. That would have been for some nice character continuity. For example, the episode Diesel and the Ducklings is about Thomas blackmailing Diesel after finding out Diesel has a soft side and loves ducklings. Now imagine this story, but with Duck in Thomas's place. How much more perfect would that have been? Duck finally getting that one up on Diesel. Frickin' Duck is even in the title. Come on now, it was right there! Or how about Duck's fascination with the sea that they never touch on again? So much of these CGI seasons are based on the coast and it's never brought up once. We never get any fun Duck and Percy team up moments either. Would have loved to see a story where these two pair up against one of the newer characters or something. My criticisms aside, I do think Duck was overall handled fairly well in the CGI series, which is heavy praise considering some of the other characters. I'm looking at you, Henry. <laughs> Just the fact he was in it was wowing enough, and the fact they never did anything stupid or untrue to the character was even more wowing. Okay, now that we've gone through all the eras of the series, I want to talk about something. This is a theory I have had forever, and I want to know how many people agree with me on it. My theory that Thomas and Duck, very subtly, hate each other. There's so much in all eras of the franchise that support this. It's very rare we actually get Thomas and Duck interactions, and every time we do, they usually go south. Let's take a look. In the Railway Series story, The Runaway, Duck takes over the branch line while Thomas is ill. Annie and Clarabelle are swooned by him, and when Thomas returns and hears how well Duck managed, he becomes jealous. Annie and Clarabelle told him how well Duck had managed. Though Thomas was jealous at first, he was so pleased to be home that he soon forgot it. This is also the case in the TV version of this story. In The Thomas Way, which is the only episode where these two pair up, the entire plot revolves around them never agreeing on anything. Duck was sticking to the Great Western Way, and that was that. This made Thomas cross. The two become pretty quickly frustrated with each other. In Fish, Thomas tries to give Duck advice, and immediately, Duck is standoffish to him. Going fishing? I'd take care if I were you. Why, Huff Duck? And in turn, Thomas becomes offended and snippy. And I know what I'm talking about. Good night. In Scaredy Engines, Duck happily orchestrates the plan to spook Thomas at the smelters. And it works. He's after me! To Duck's delight. In Saved You, Thomas makes several mistakes and gets the other engines in trouble, including Duck. At the end of the episode, he helps all the engines he wronged, but not Duck. In a close shave, Thomas has nothing but a giant grin on his face when pulling Duck out of the barber shop. In Spotless Record, Duck passes Thomas and whistles at him, but Thomas doesn't whistle back. That evening, Arthur was having the squashed fruit cleaned out of his funnel. In Grand Puff, Thomas tells the engines a story one night about Duke. Duck specifically requests the story have a happy ending. But, added Duck, it must have a happy ending. Thomas cuts the story short that night, and waits to tell the ending on a night when Duck isn't in the sheds. Duck requested the happy ending, and Thomas kept him from hearing it. And finally, in the movie Journey Beyond Sodor, Thomas has a big musical number where he misses all his friends back home on Sodor. He has a fantasy sequence where he imagines all his friends together, and the only standard gauge engine not present is Duck, because he doesn't see Duck as a friend. Case closed, done deal. This is all just a fun theory, of course, but it's too fun not to humor. Even if they don't actually hate each other, and I'm sure that was never the intention from any of the writers, I have to imagine that Thomas and Duck would actually never get along. 
Thomas is pretty egotistical, very cheeky, and thinks rather highly of himself. You tease him, and he takes it personally. A character that gladly would break the rules if it means he gets what he wants. Duck, however, is a traditionalist, proud of his heritage, and very by the books. He does things the proper way. Contrast that with Thomas, who will do whatever if it means he gets to have more fun. That's the plot of the Thomas way, basically. Duck wanted to go directly to their destination, but Thomas wanted to go on the fun route. These two don't get along because they have very conflicting ideologies. The proper, the by the books, the square, versus the brash and the fun seeker, the round. As far as I'm concerned, these two hate each other because it aligns with all their stories and because I just think it's funny. Thomas? Um... Duck really was treated well in all eras of this franchise. It's clear the writers all understand Duck is a special character. You'll never see Duck in a stupid story where he has to collect the giant bubble liquid container and take it to the clown show or whatever. There's like this unspoken rule among all that Duck is a character that deserves some time taken with him. When it comes to choosing between the three different eras, oh, this is gonna be a hard one. It's a really tough pick, but I think I'm gonna have to go with the Railway series. Duck's character journey is really fleshed out in the books, and I love seeing that slow rise from random one-off to main character. When all is set and done though, I don't think you could really go wrong with any of the eras. From hosting episodes with the grandest of morals such as All at Sea in the Model series, and a backstory complete with real-world railway operations in the CGI series, Duck really was a catalyst for good storytelling in all eras of the show. He is not just some silver object to jingle in front of the fanboys for good boy points. Duck is a symbol of quality in this series, through and through. He only became a major character in the Railway series once it started to work in the real-world tie-ins we all love. His design alone is proof of that. He is prominent in all of the wonderful classic seasons of the show. He was the first character the team brought back to kick off the CGI series renaissance period. And hell, even in the show's worst era ever, Duck managed to get an episode and it was actually pretty good. Duck represents quality in the Thomas series. He was never tarnished by any bad era of the series, because when the series hit its low points, he wasn't in it. It's pretty wonderful that we have this one singular character that was never ruined, never tainted, never made into a stupid idiot child. I totally understand now why he is the mecha uber fan favorite that he is. Duck was and is always good with far more to him than meets the eye. A true Sodor's finest, if I ever saw one. Duck still wanders about the lands beyond the horizon, but he treasures being with friends most of all. And I think he knows that sometimes the best travels are those we can only dream about. That amazing narration for the intro and outro was done by Tom Marshall, a very talented voice actor, modeler, and fellow Thomas fan. If you have a Twitter, I highly recommend giving him a follow because he deserves the attention. Link in the description. Thanks for narrating, Tom. Really appreciate it. I have to say, I never ever expected a Sodor's Finest on Duck to be this long. I never knew Duck was a character that I had so much to say about. But I am glad that he's finally been covered. He deserves his spot up top with the rest of the greats. We've now covered Gordon, Edward, Henry, Scarloey, James, Toby, Hero, and Duck now. I wonder who will get the next spot. A lot of you have requested Thomas for Sodor's Finest, 
and while I would love to cover him, and I have a great idea in mind of how I'd like to do that, I do want to save Thomas for a special occasion. If Duck Alone is 48 minutes, then there's no doubt Thomas would be well over an hour. Maybe when I hit 300k subscribers or something. We'll see how things go. Alrighty, so, channel updates. So first of all, I am now fully moved into my new place, and now back to my normal routine. I'm going to spend some time working on new Thomas Debunks shorts, and those will be uploaded here and to TikTok when they are finished. And then I'll move on to the next big video as voted for in the poll on my Patreon. If you'd like to participate in voting for the next big video, then head on over and pledge today. That's really all from me, folks. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you all stay safe out there. See y'all in the next one. Uh, uh, beg pardon, sir. Uh, uh, please excuse my intrusion. What the fuck is that? <laughs>